We rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to thank you all for attending. There's a lot of options, not as many as there used to be, but we're grateful that you've chose to worship with us here this morning or upstairs in the uh, kind of the COVID secure area or online. Uh, the Lord woke me up this morning early and uh, I was just praying, praying for our service for Jason and our family and the Lord brought to my mind a lot of people who aren't comfortable coming and it was just name after name after name and it's it just kind of hurt hurt to think about <laughs> sorry it makes me a little emotional we care about you people and you're probably watching online and I want you all to know that we are praying and we care very much about you and uh, remember that uh, we do have a couple announcements. Um, Brian's going to come up and talk a little about missions, and then Fuzzy about pictures, and then we'll go from there. So, Brian, come on up. All right. Okay. Great. Good morning. So uh, we had a visitor this morning, Byron. Byron's out there. The first I shook Byron's hand. The first thing he said to me is, "I'm not afraid of you." <laughs> so I'm just like, I think he's the only one. So, uh, uh, an announcement, uh, so next week, this is to get you queued up to attend the mission committee meeting um, that we're kicking off for this year, next Sunday. So, so our theme for this year for Faith Promise for Missions was the next generation, so next slide, I'll have to move through these quick, because uh, Pastor Jim said, Brian, it's just announcements, not a sermon. Um, so, hey, Star Trek, so uh, come join our Trek for Missions. So my, uh, my announcement this morning is, is kind of a Star Trek theme. Um, so that's the next generation crew, but uh, so we're looking for we're looking for people to be on the mission committee, and, and and everybody seems to ask this question. Well, just they don't know what the mission committee does, and I, so I'm not sure what I can offer. And this is a kind of a take. I don't want to sign up for a five-year mission to boldly go where no one has gone before. So because um, that's kind of the Star Trek theme, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to boldly go where where no one's gone before you just have to I guess boldly go to a meeting with someone like me um, but uh, so next slide so uh, hey look there's Picard like you know when you got nothing else to do you know you can you can go to a mission committee meeting you know and we don't it's like Picard that we don't have meetings all the time we just get together and meet every uh, about every once a month Maybe if there's a holiday month and we don't meet that much, but you know, eight, ten times a year is uh, how often we get together. Um, next slide. So, uh, right, and we do different things, right? We, through the Faith Promise, um, raising funds for the missionaries, and so we, we disperse those funds to the missionaries. We, we help plan things like ice cream socials if our missionaries come to a visit, a dinner, an ice cream social, something like that. When we get together our meetings, first thing we do is we... We pray for our missionaries um, and uh, things like that. And then we, we look at opportunities to learn and grow. So things like, you know, hosting a secret church event this year. This year, it's, in, it's always in April, but um, uh, it's called the Great Imbalance. I shared about that a couple weeks ago. And then uh, we maybe help plan and prepare, you know, Operation Christmas Child, things like that. So it's just really keeping missions in front of the church. That's, you know, that's a core value. Um, for the church, it, it should be a core value for us as, as disciples of, of Christ. Um, so uh, next, next slide. So we do that and we, you know, Star Trek, they're out on their five-year mission to, out there, you know, to go out into the galaxy. We don't have to reach the whole galaxy. Jesus said we only have to reach the whole world, you know. But he promised it was going to happen, right? So it's going to happen. Um, and we get to be a part of that. So, uh, so coming soon, there we go, there's a, there's a bunch of folks from uh, Star Trek Captains and Commanders, so our, our next meeting's coming soon, it's next, it's next Sunday right after church. We won't have a big meal like we do today, but uh, we'll, have a, we'll just have a short, short meeting just to see who's interested, and uh, we'll see who the Lord brings, and we'll, we'll go from there. And, uh, okay, next slide. Oh, there we go, so you could just say... Beam me up, Scotty, right? Just, you know, come to the meeting. Beam me up, Scotty. So, uh, Scotty was an engineer. I'm an engineer, so I like, uh, I like Commander Scott. So, uh, next, and this, 
There we go. So if uh, usually, for those you know, I paint my face up, you know, occasionally, and usually it's as a flag. But this time it was, uh, it was. Uh, there's a good sermon out of this too. Um, uh, but it's from a episode called "Let That Be Your Last Your Last Battlefield." So uh, that's Loki and Beale. It's interesting because uh, Star Trek would kind of touch on the social norms and mores and things going on in culture. And uh, it's kind of a parallel almost what's going on in our society with battles between different groups of people. So these two, these two, they're chasing each other across the galaxy. Uh, Beale's trying to bring Loki back. And, and there's, there's racism going on because if you don't know, realize it, Loki's black on the left and Beale is white on the left. And so they come back, so Beale's got to get and bring Loki back to their home planet. So they, they, they hijack the ship, they get back to their planet to find out that their planet's burning. Everyone's dead because of their hatred and their bigotry and everything else. And it's real, you know, we, you can take those things and you can apply them to our society, right? There's a lot of things going on in our culture and in the, across the world with, with things like this. But at the end of the day, if people don't have Jesus, it's all going to come burning down. And it's our, Jesus tasked us with taking the gospel and the good news of reconciliation and salvation to the whole world. I figure maybe having a cute face will help sell the photos a little better. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough act to follow following Brian, so uh, good morning, family. Um, I'm Detective Fuzzy. I have a case that I need to solve, and I need your help. It's the case of the missing photos. I have a list. Not all of my names have been crossed off on the list, so I need to find those photos. Uh, we have a photo booth set up in the back uh, for those of you that have not gotten photos yet. If you don't want your photo taken, uh, I have an email for you to send your photos to. It is Katie, K-A-T-I-E, at cornerstoneict.church. And uh, you can send those there, and then we will use those for the directory. So if you have specific photos you'd like to use, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I think, the, uh, I think the potted plants and the ghillie suits are supposed to come in on Tuesday, so we'll start photobombing on Wednesday, maybe? <laughs> we'll see. Um, anyway... In all seriousness, though, uh, the youth have done a great job in helping to corral people and to man the tables and write down names and information. So I'd appreciate if you give them a hand for that. <laughs> so the photo booth will be set up after the, will be open after the service. So if you'd please stop by and get your photos, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Wave hi to everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Fuzzy. So we have an exciting day for you. As you all know, we've been um, working at finding a replacement and a new pastor to lead us. And uh, we have our second finalist with us this morning. And uh, Jason and Heidi and their daughter Chloe are with us today. You guys could wave and Jason will be up in a few minutes delivering a message for us. Uh, their other son, Karsten, our son, uh, his adult son wasn't able to join us, but uh, we are excited that they're here. And uh, after the service, upstairs, there's uh, lots of food available. If you didn't make plans, and if you did, stop and, and grab something to eat. You can take a picture while you're waiting and visit with uh, the White family. And uh, we're excited about what he has in store for us this morning. Uh, continue to pray for the, the committee as we meet this week, and we have, I believe, a very difficult decision ahead of us, and we covet your prayers on that. Um, fill out the attendance cards that you might have with you and the, uh, um, and the paperwork and put those in the offering later. At this point, we're, we're going to pray, and then we'll go into our, our worship time. Our Heavenly Father, we just invite you to join us this morning. I'm going to lift up Jason as he prepares a message. I'm going to prepare... Uh, I want to pray for Steve and Rhonda as they lead us in worship and that you're, you would be glorified this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you stand and join me this morning as we sing together? These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. Here we go. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. How many of you never heard that before in your life? Raise your hand. Four of you. Okay, so now everybody else, let's talk a little bit here this morning. This is a great song. It covers some of the history of God's dealing with his people through time. And it ends with a resounding promise that he is coming. You, do you believe that this morning? Is he coming again? Good, good. We're getting a little better. We'll work through this, and by the time Jason's ready to come speak to us, hopefully we'll all be on board and ready to go this morning. Sing the next verse. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Make this proclamation this morning. There is no God like Jehovah. 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 Like Jehovah. Behold, he comes riding on a cloud, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. I just came to praise the Lord. I hope that's why you're here this morning as we sing together. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. And I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name 
it to him this morning. I give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory Supper, participation in communion. One of the amazing things about the God that we serve is He is constantly, completely involved in everything that's going on around us. We as humans, we're limited by these finite minds that we have. We can't see, obviously, everything God can, know everything that He does. But there's a tremendous promise for the child of God when we're surrounded by so many things and we're challenged by so many things as we are right now in our world we can slip away just kind of slide out of this world and all its challenges and move into the presence of God the Father Almighty if you'll pardon my phraseology <laughs> Paul was the one who wrote let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find help in time of trouble in the presence of Jehovah. I hope these words are a blessing. Join me as we get to the chorus in a minute, but listen to these words. In and out of situations that tug of war at me All day long I struggle for the answers that I Then I come into your presence, all my questions become Yeah. 
Thank you, Steve and Rhonda. You guys always do a phenomenal job preparing our hearts. Um, coming to a time of communion, and uh, one of the things that we do weekly here at Cornerstone, and it's available to all who have accepted Christ as their Savior. And uh, as the men go ahead and come forward and pass those out, you'll find that there's two cups together that you'll receive. One has the juice and one has the bread. And in a few minutes after I go through the, a little bit of reading and then pray, we'll take both of those together. We've been, been doing it separate the last two Sundays, but we're going to kind of do this together today and with a little time of prayer and uh, just to kind of examine yourselves. Um, so two weeks ago, I um, read the account from Luke, and then last week from Matthew. This week, I'm going to read to you Paul's account. And Paul wasn't personally there, but evidently uh, he's well aware of the process and describes it in the same manner. But he adds a little bit of information and a little bit of a warning as well. So I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. And Paul saying, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you pro proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Paul goes on and adds this information. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So this morning... After I pray, just take a few minutes and pray and examine yourself. And make sure that you're where you need to be before accepting and taking communion. And it's okay if you decide not to. Put it back. Have the men will come by and take the used cups. Just put them back in with that. We can't reuse them at this point, and that's fine. But uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we praise you. We, we sense your, your spirit here. We thank you that you're, you're with us, that you've paid the penalty, and that we can accept the free gift, and that heaven is in our future. We just thank you for this bread and this juice that we take right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Time for the offering, and again, this is another form of worship that we can uh, focus on the Lord. 
And uh, the Lord has richly bl blessed us in this country, and we've become complacent. And uh, it's time for us to step up, not only financially, but also with, with all parts of our, our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have richly bl blessed us, and we have much to do. Um, the fields are ripe for harvest, and we are the workers. We have much to do. I ask that you would help bless what comes financially and provide us opportunities for each to step up and use their gifts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we read from God's Word? <clears throat> Being 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him, and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. You may be seated. Uh, Jason, come on up. I'd like to introduce to you Jason White. I want to pray for him as he pre prepares to speak to you and that your hearts will be moved this morning. Heavenly Father, just ask for a blessing on Jason, on what his words, what you have for him to say. This is you speaking through him. And we just bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, as Kevin said, my name is Jason White. My wife, Heidi, is uh, right down there. Uh, we've been married for 26 years. And uh, that's not nearly enough uh, to say that we you know, have, have, uh, are perfect at marriage by any means. But we've been married a while. We have, uh, we have two kids, uh, Karsten, who is 20. And as Kevin said earlier, we're, he can't be with us today, and here's the reason why. Karsten is embarking on, um, well, he's in his final three months of paramedic school, and he's here in Wichita, and uh, he is doing an internship with uh, Sedgwick County EMS, and um, he has to have, I think, like 2,500 hours of internship before he can take his national test in May. And so he has a group of, of mentors that he works with, and uh, when they work, he works. And uh, in order to get those hours, he works a lot. He does not have any social time anymore to himself, and he, uh, he is, is strictly thinking, eating, breathing, everything paramedic. And so we're excited for him, but that is why he can't be here. But he uh, you know, said, go get him, Dad. And I said, okay. So I've got my, uh, my son's hurrah charge to go get you, uh, and uh, uh, so there's that, and then we have Chloe, wonderful, wonderful Chloe. Chloe's 14, and uh, there are many of you uh, who have 14-year-olds and um, can attest to the fact that um, 
14 years is a good age. And we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but uh, Chloe loves everything uh, sports related. Primarily volleyball and soccer. And she's going to try track this year, and so we're excited about that. Um, and uh, she is our social butterfly. She doesn't know a stranger. And um, this is the, the little girl who, when, when she was younger, would go up to everyone and say hello and, and all this. And we were like, okay, stranger danger, honey, stranger danger. You don't know those people. You need to come back here. It didn't matter to her. She did. She went and she conquered and, and everyone became her friend. And so uh, she has lots and lots and lots of friends. And uh, that's our social butterfly. You know, um, I, I grew up in Wichita and uh, went to West High School. Don't hold that against me. Um, you went to West High? Yeah! Wow! Okay, we'll talk later. Okay, good. We'll share some stories. Um, but uh, my parents, probably in late elementary school, started coming to this church before it was Cornerstone. It came to this church when it was town and country. And, and in fact, Heidi uh, grew up in Denver, and um, believe it or not, we crossed each other's paths at this church before we knew each other. Her grandparents, uh, Olin and Jeannie Hoisington, were, well, he was one of the founding elders of Town & Country Christian Church before uh, it became Cornerstone. And uh, my dad baptized me when I was in sixth grade in that sanctuary, in that baptismal. And so I feel like I'm back home a little bit. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. Um, but we were looking after we got married in, in one of her parents' um, treasure uh, trunks, and I found this bulletin, and I'm like, I, I, I recognize this bulletin. And I said, that's from town and country. And she said, well, yeah, we, you know, you know grandparents, my grandparents went there. Yeah, yeah. And, and as she goes, we would go there at Christmas time. I looked at that bulletin, and my name was in that bulletin. I had read a passage of scripture for Christmas Eve service, and she was there. God is good, folks. God is good. We didn't even know each other. She had every opportunity to go, I don't want to be around that guy. But we didn't know each other. We go to Manhattan Christian College. We meet up. And to say that everything was perfect, she didn't like me very well back then. She grew to love me. And we can talk about that story at a later date. But, you know, we've been in ministry for 27, almost 28 years. And through that time, we've gone through a lot of life changes. We've experienced a lot of things, good, bad, and ugly. We've experienced new season after new season after new season. And one thing I know about change, change is one of those things that you either like or dislike. I think it's, it's an either hot or cold topic. You either like to talk about change or you'd rather disappear when people start talking about change. But change, however we may view it, is inevitable. We have the change of year. Every year we have a change. This year, more than any other, from 2020 to 2021 was a huge change. The gas prices are ever-changing we have the change in the economy, up and down, back and forth. The change of what the pandemic is doing every single day. Is it up? Is it down? People that we know, are they in the hospital or are they not? Are they suffering from, from COVID-19 or not? The change is, is all around us, week by week. There are changes that we can't control, and then there are changes that we make to better our circumstances. Changes like health. We want to, every year, we set that, that January 1 as the marker date that we're going to start something new, that we're going to start living better, or we're going to be healthier, which is a good thing. Even as Cornerstone moves into a new, new season, there are changes that are occurring. This morning, I, I want to talk a little bit about what the Bible says, because I think that the Bible, over any books, any, uh, and I'm a counselor, but any, what any other counselor would say, the Bible is the most important thing to understand where we're headed. 
and it should be preached and it should be taught and it should be studied and it should be just so a part of our lives that we arm the Holy Spirit to fight on our behalf. Because we're going to go through problems, we're going to go through challenges, we're going to go through changes, and the Holy Spirit is armed when we study God's Word. And so I want to talk a little bit this morning about what the Bible says about new seasons, what the Bible says about changes, because whether we like it or not, we're going to face them. And as Kevin read, 1 Kings chapter 1 through 3, we're going to be looking at that verse, and then if you would, if you don't have that, uh, that passage already open, go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3, but go ahead and hold your, your finger or put a bookmark in there, because we're going to be looking at two other chapters throughout 1 Kings this morning. But David is dying here. And Solomon, is, his son, is being charged to take his place. Change number one. A very terrifying change, if you will. You see, the first thing the Bible teaches us about change, about a new season, is that a new season brings changes. The man who had led Israel successfully for many, 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 many years... The man who people loved. The man that, that scripture says is after God's own heart. He's dying. And Solomon is now going to be expected to fill his shoes. You see, that was, that was, that was customary. Every king wanted to have a son so that he could pass his legacy on. And here is that moment. Solomon had to be, in my opinion, a ball of emotions at this moment. He's with his dad and the time is drawing near and he's having this conversation. He's upset that his dad was dying and, and maybe a tad bit excited and yet hesitant to become the new king. You see, we have a, a love-hate relationship with change. On one hand, we want change because without it, things get boring and stagnant. And we want excitement. We want something different. On the other hand, we want things to stay the same because with change comes some uncertainty. And uncertainty bothers us. Because we can't figure out exactly what might be next. And I think that's the uncertainty is, is why we sometimes are afraid of change. You see, Cornerstone is entering into a new season. And indulge me, if you would, for a moment. Jim, your former retired pastor, is retiring after 27 years of ministry. That's a long time, folks. A long time. A long time for anyone to spend at one church doing the things that, as pastors, we love. And so, he's been here for 27 years, you're entering into this new season. In fact, there's a possibility that he's been the only pastor some of you have ever known, depending on how long you've been at this church. You've grown to love he and his family, but now there's a change, and it doesn't feel good. And whoever comes in to be his new, the new pastor is going to have a hard time, I, I promise you, filling his shoes. He will not be Jim and will most, not, most likely not do the same things that Jim did. It will feel weird. It will feel different. But I want to remind us of something that I know to be true Every time we go through things we don't like, every time we go through changes and new seasons, I want to remind us of something. God is good at stretching us and making us uncomfortable for a period of time. Why? For growing us. You see, our purpose in life is to grow in God. And sometimes there's things that we don't like that God uses to grow us. And so we have this moment at Cornerstone where there's some things that are happening that feel uncomfortable, that feel weird, and we wonder what's next. And so there's some uncertainty. But be encouraged. 
that God is using this to grow you. And in order for us to grow spiritually, in order for us to grow mentally and physically, there has to be change. And whether we like it or not, truthfully, if we're truthful with ourselves, change is good for all of us. The second thing the Bible teaches us about a new season is this. A new season brings challenges. It brings challenges. Flip over, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 3. i got to get my glasses on. Uh, I, I noticed probably starting in 2019, 2020, that the doctor, the eye doctor, was saying that I couldn't see very well. I thought I could see just fine. Until I started reading scripture from the pulpit, and I'm like, I, what is that word? I can't see that word. So she told me to go ahead and get readers, and I, I'm only, I'll be 48 in March. Okay, I'm not ready for readers. But she says it's time for readers. So I, I, I get readers, and so bear with me as we put these on. All right, I'm going to read from chapter 3. You can follow along with me. Starting with verse 5, it says these words. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, I love what God says here, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now listen to what Solomon says here. You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now listen to what he says. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern these great people of yours? I love Solomon's boldness. And because of that boldness, because he, he, he says this to God, and, and, and continue reading that passage at, at some point in time, God grants him that more. God is impressed that he doesn't ask for wealth. He doesn't ask for all of these things. He just asks for wisdom to govern his people. And God grants that and more. But what we see here is this challenge. Solomon not only had changed positions, he was, he was still the son, but now all of a sudden he's got, getting forced into this position to now be the king and rule over all these people. Remember God's promise to David and that David had all of these, these, these new, too numerous to count, all these people, and now Solomon had to be the man in charge. I think... Solomon is experiencing all these changes, and and now all of a sudden he sees the challenges that are coming with these changes. First, he's grieving over the loss of his father. And we, some of us here, know all too well how difficult that is to be able to function when you're grieving the loss of a loved one. So imagine, if you will, now you're forced into some governing position and you have to deal with the grieving over a loss of a loved one and then having to deal with being forced into this new position. Second, I'm intrigued at what Solomon calls himself here in verse 7. He calls himself a little child, not knowing how to carry out his duties. Now, he wasn't a child per se. I went back and did a little bit of study and found out how old he was. He was about 20. And yet he considers himself too young to be able to do this responsibility. I I get it. We have a 20-year-old that I mentioned earlier doing pretty adult-type stuff. And yet he's still a child to us. He started his his, his process of of, of, of paramedic and all of that at the age of 17. And I don't know if you you realize this, that the state of Kansas gives a 17-year-old permission to get an EMT license and treat people in a paramedicine type environment. 17, he started this. That's when we knew God had placed a calling on Karsten, because he loved it. 
We had gone to colleges and set him up. And he was going to be a, a veterinarian. He's got a whole slew of goats back in Oakley. He raises goats. He showed goats. Chloe showed pigs. And he threw all that away. I mean, we had gone to schools and we went to the veterinary, you know, classes and the schooling and we, we were talking about what he needed. And I mean, like a light bulb, like a light switch, it just changed. He, we came home. He was like, I'm prepared, I'm ready to do this. He talks to a friend who's taking this class from high school. And now all of a sudden, things change. See, he's forced, back in Oakley, we... we um, we have only EMTs, and I-70 runs through the outskirts of Oakley. The closest people to be reaching accident victims on the highway is Oakley. At the age of 17, our son has life and death situations. I can't, I can't imagine how his life changed overnight. And David has now passed away, and Solomon is experiencing some of these same things. He's struggling. Maybe some of you here this morning are, are facing some of the same challenges of changes in your life. Maybe some of you are facing challenges of, of raising your children. Maybe some of you this morning are here wondering and facing the challenge of elderly parents and trying to help them through this pandemic. Maybe some of you here this morning are facing the challenge of how you're going to take care of yourself, let alone your parents or your children. See, to be honest, maybe some of us here this morning are facing the challenge of how to move forward after our pastor has retired. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to face those challenges. It's okay to understand that I'm not sure that I really like what's going on right now. God is there. He's not left you. He's not forsaken you. He's leading you through it. See, we need to face our challenges much like Solomon faced his challenges. We see in Scripture that Solomon faced his challenges with humility and he was always seeking the wisdom of the Lord. And if we're honest with ourselves, maybe some of us are lacking that wisdom. I mean, we're, we're, we're scratching at the surface trying to figure it out. And let, let me remind us of something. James chapter 1, verse 5 says this. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. See, we need to seek God's wisdom during times when we need ourselves when we find ourselves in challenging situations not just with these challenges but with all challenges this is just one of many challenges that we will face if we look back at our life we'll recognize some, some of the challenges and we'll wonder how in the world did we get through some of these things god was there he got you through them and so you're back at that moment again and you're facing this challenge and you're going, how am I going to get through this? I'm going to remind us again, God is with us. He'll get us through it. And it won't be the last challenge that we'll face. There'll be many more challenges that we'll face until God says, welcome home, good and faithful servant. But there's a third thing that, I, that the Bible teaches us and we see here in this passage. A new season brings champions. Champions. We all can be champions in a season of change. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke, or sorry, with, uh, to 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, we're going to continue, so it's just a couple more chapters over. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. And it says these words. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Think about that for a second. The glory of the Lord filled his temple. Verse 12. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. While the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them. 
See, Solomon, through all of these changes, was asked to build this temple to God. And we see that it was a remarkable temple. Why do we see that? Because we see that the presence of God filled the temple. But how does Solomon arrive at this moment, this pinnacle? This is like one of the the greatest things of his kingship, that he builds this temple. How does he get there? Because we read a few chapters before this that he's only a child and doesn't think he can do it. Solomon worked through the changes that came his way, and here's how he did it. As he worked through them, he was able to accept them. He was able to see his new role in all of these changes because God was with him. God was with him. See, he faced these challenges that came his way with humility and always seeking the Lord's wisdom. Some of us may be thinking, I, I, don't, know that I, could, I don't know that I can do that. I don't don't know that I could ever be used for anything great. I I, I don't have anything to offer God. How how in the world am I going to be able to get through this? David had had his son Solomon, and Solomon was an amazing man, and he was the wisest man of all time. Let me remind us of what he said again. He was a 20 year old, and he said, I'm only a child, I can't do this. He didn't think he had anything to offer either. Some of you maybe say, I I tried, but but I always end up failing. Maybe, just maybe, you've been trying with your own strength. You see, the key to being a champion is submitting yourself to Christ. Letting Him do the hard work. And following Him where He leads. See, it all starts with accepting the changes that He may want to make in our lives. Walking in faith through those challenges. Moving forward humbly and obediently into what God wants us to do. That is how a champion is born. By trusting God every step of the way. Walter Payton. I don't know how many of you know Walter Payton. Walter Payton was said to have been one of the greatest running backs of all time. Now, there may be disagreements, especially with the Super Bowl coming up next week. But back in his day, he was said to be one of the greatest running backs of all time. His nickname, anybody remember his nickname? Sweetness, right. Any of you remember his motto? His motto was, never die easy. He and his team, the Chicago Bears, many of us remember this, were the 1985 Super Bowl champions. And over his entire career, Peyton rushed for 16,726 yards, which broke the record at the time for the most rushing yards by any NFL player in history. And he scored 110 touchdowns. That's remarkable in itself, but there's more. He caught 492 passes for 4,538 yards and 15 touchdowns. Peyton set several team records, including the most career rushing yards, receptions, and touchdowns, and his jersey number was retired by the Bears, and he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1993. He did all of this without ever celebrating a touchdown. I didn't realize this. He wasn't into showboating. He wasn't into to, 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 to the fanfare after the touchdown. He simply would hand the football to his teammate or to the referee and walk away. He did an interview as his career was coming to a close. And he was asked, how were you able to set all those records and do all those things that you did on the field? Listen to what he said. He simply said, one play at a time, by getting back up after each challenging play and doing it all over again. That's exactly how God wants us to handle change and challenges in our life. 
one challenge, one change at a time. By getting back up and trusting God to do what he's always done all over again. See, God is faithful. He's faithful over and over and over and over. He never leaves us. He walks us through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Catch this, every year. Not just one time, not just in 2020 because it was the worst time of our life. Every year He walks us through the good, the bad, and the ugly. And here's the reality. Because He does that, because He's faithful over and over and over and over, and because He never leaves us and He walks us through the good, the bad, and the ugly, every year we can trust Him. We can trust Him. We can trust Him with our big things and our small things, with our enormous things. Why? Because He's that big and He's that good. And we can trust Him with this church. It's His church. He's not going to forsake his church. You see, there's nothing greater than being used by God to accomplish something awesome. Maybe you're unsure what God is asking of you. Maybe this morning he's asking for you to accept him, to place your trust, your life in his hands. Maybe this morning he's asking you to take that bit of challenge, the new season of change, and Give it to Him and trust Him with it. Maybe God wants you to serve Him in this church. Maybe He wants you to to start a new ministry in this body. Maybe He's asking you to be a part of a specific ministry. I mean, we heard of our missions ministry, right? They're in need of help. Maybe God struck a chord with you when He got up here and spoke. Maybe God is asking you to join a specific ministry. Maybe He's asking you to reach out to your coworkers or your friends or your, your family members or your neighbors for Him. You see, everyone, everyone can be a champion. But whatever He's asking you, He's creating you to be a champion for Him in a new season. For many today, God has spoken loud and clear, and you're fully aware of what He's asking. Let him know that you hear him. He's knocking. He's reminding. Let him know that you hear him. Acknowledge what God is leading you to and then be obedient in doing what he's asking. There are others that God is speaking about. He's speaking to you about. Maybe you... Just not quite sure what exactly he's saying, what exactly he's leading you to. Here's what I would say. Be open. Be prepared. Be ready to hear what God has in store, especially when God appears to be doing something that's (laughs) far-fetched. Because that's when he grows us. Something that We couldn't possibly do on our own, but God can. Maybe God's calling you to himself this morning, to be in a relationship with him. I would ask you to let today, let let today be the day you choose to enter a new season of life by receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. You alone are worthy of our praise. And God, I thank you so much for never leaving us in the midst of change and challenge and new seasons. God, I thank you for being there. God, I thank you for challenging us at times and growing us and stretching us. Father, I thank you for never giving up on us. Father, I pray a special blessing on Cornerstone right now, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would bring them comfort and peace during a time of new season and challenge and change. Father, you would be with the elders 
as they seek you and your wisdom and your guidance and direction, as they pick your man to lead your church. Father, thank you for loving us, for your grace and your mercy. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing? upstairs at this point and we'll dismiss in just a minute that way you'll be able to be up there to greet people as they come up if that would work so again thank you very much we're going to dismiss in prayer and, and we'll also bless the food kevin is there anything else i need to do here i'm good all right let's pray father thank you so much for the promises of your word thank you for your word coming to us this morning through your your, your servant God, we pray that you'll bless now in these next few days with decisions. We can even echo what our brother just prayed, God. Give wisdom to our committee who's leading, making decisions now to every one of us. Thank you for the food and our time this morning. We pray you'll bless that. And we ask again that you'll just go with us now, day by day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.